And as you remain standing, I'd like to read from Jonah, chapter 3, the entire chapter, actually. We'll be considering it in just a few moments. Jonah, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Please be seated. Lord, this is certainly a powerful passage, a powerful episode in human history. Help us to understand what happened there But more importantly, help us to know what it is that we are to gain from what happened so many years ago. By your spirit, give us insight into the relevancy of your word for us today, this moment. Speak to us, I pray, in Christ's name, amen. In the year 1734, a while ago, in the small town of Northampton, Massachusetts, there was a small congregational church. Its pastor was named Jonathan Edwards. And in the early 1730s, an amazing thing happened in Northampton. People started coming to Christ in droves. In all of the surrounding area were affected. Church attendance boomed. The change in the society in terms of morality was incredible. It led to what historians have referred to as the first great awakening in our country. Of course, this was before we were actually a country. We were still colonies then. The first great awakening. Jonathan Edwards in Northampton, George Whitfield, who traveled up and down the East Coast, the Wesleys in England, It was an incredible time where the gospel was being proclaimed and scores and scores of people were coming to Christ and society was being changed. It was a great time. Edwards wrote an essay describing what happened in Northampton during that period of time. And it was titled this. I love, if you've ever done any historical reading, you know that They used to have very, very long titles to books that probably wouldn't pass muster today. But his essay describing what happened there is titled, A Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God in the Conversion of Many Hundred Souls in Northampton. 
that essay has become mandatory reading in seminaries ever since. I've read it. Many of you may have too. It's an incredible account where Jonathan Edwards just tells what happened and tries to put it in context as to why it happened. But what I found interesting was the title. I'll read it again. The Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God in the Conversion of Many Hundred Souls in Northampton. The word that jumped out at me was the word surprising. The surprising work of God. And by surprising, Edwards meant out of the norm, unexpected, not something you would sense would be happening often. Surprising. Edwards himself, if you read that treatise, seems absolutely amazed as he is being used by God in this revival he says, I don't get it. I don't understand. But it's glorious and it's wonderful that God is doing such a work. Surprising work of God. If that was surprising, then what have we to say about Jonah chapter 3? What we read about in Jonah chapter 3 has to be surprising with a capital S, bold font and underlined several times with exclamation points. We cannot read Jonah 3 and not have, be saying, wow, I can't believe that really happened. In fact, it is so surprising that through the years, many people have scoffed at it. Many people have said, well, that didn't happen. It couldn't have happened. Nothing like that happens. But it happened. It happened, and Jonah was a part of that, and we have it recorded here. What has been called the greatest revival in human history. And that's not over the top. That's completely accurate. Where have we seen such a thing happen? like this. What makes this so surprising? Several things, really. First of all, it's surprising because of the person whom God used to bring it about. Jonah. We spent the last few weeks looking at Jonah. What kind of a guy was he? He was a prophet, but he was not exactly a great one. I mean, he ran away from God, he disobeyed God, and the reason that he didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place was is because he hated the Ninevites. And he would be very, very happy if God just wiped them off the face of the earth. He would rather die himself than to see God bless them. And he only went to Nineveh after God made it pretty clear that that's what he was going to do. God took some extraordinary measures to make sure that Jonah got it. Jonah, you're going to go to Nineveh, whether you like it or not. And Jonah is the one who is used by God to be the instrument of this great revival. How surprising is that? He would use a prophet who had so little passion and compassion for the people he was preaching to. It's unbelievable. And then it's also surprising because of the people themselves who were revived. We're talking about the Ninevites here. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. They were the most evil, wicked, vile people on the face of the earth at that time, and maybe ever. The level of their cruelty is beyond expression. I've read accounts of it. And it makes your stomach turn. They were the ISIS of their day. <laughs> sort of ISIS on steroids, if you can believe it. 
They are the last people on earth that you would say were candidates to experience a religious revival. If you were to list all the peoples of the earth at that particular point and said, one of them is going to be revived, what one do you think it was? Nineveh would be at the very bottom of your list. In fact, it may not make the list. It was such a horrendous place. So you have a prophet who didn't want to go there, and you have the most unholy people on the face of the earth to whom he goes, And then what makes this even more surprising is the extent of the revival. The revival includes everyone. The whole city. In chapter 4 we discover there's 120,000 people in Nineveh. That's more than Lewis and Auburn combined. That's a lot of people. And the entire city is revived. Not only everyone but even the leaders, even the king, who was known for his cruelty. And it wasn't just lip service on their part. They refrained from their evil doing. They wore sackcloth, which is like a burlap kind of thing. It's very uncomfortable. And it's a sign of repentance and grieving and mourning. In this case, mourning over their own state. And they plead with God not to pour out his punishment on them, not to pour out his wrath upon them. That's unprecedented. An entire city, from a pagan king on down, repenting en masse, according to royal proclamation. Can you imagine such a thing? In our society? Can you imagine such a thing in a Ninevite society? This is an absolutely amazing thing. That's why I say it's surprising on so many levels. But it's easy to read this and say, wasn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? But what's that got to do with us. That was a long time ago. And those people are all dead and gone. And this world has gone on its merry way. And what's changed? Why is this important? I struggled with that, to be honest with you, in terms of preaching this message. What is the lesson in here for us? And then I realized something. And I think this really is the key to this passage, the key to most passages, maybe every passage in Scripture. If I were to ask you, who's the main character in this story, who would you answer? Jonah? The Ninevites? No. The main character in this story is God. He is the protagonist here. He is the one that's driving the plot. And if you don't see God in this passage, then you miss it. All it is is an interesting footnote in history. Ultimately, this passage is all about God. We see clearly in this account who God is. We learn much about his nature and his character and what he desires to do in the lives of his creation. And what we see here, and what I'd like to try to communicate to you this morning, is that we see a dual nature in God, two aspects of his essence, of his nature, of his character. And we need to understand both in order to have a complete picture as to who God is and how he treats his creation. We need to see two things. The first is that God is holy, and because of that he pours out wrath on unholiness. And then we have to see that God is love, and because of that 
He bestows compassion and mercy. We cannot see God as just one or the other or over accentuate one over the other. We must understand that God is a holy God and a loving God. That due to his holiness, he is a God who punishes sin. And due to his love, he gives opportunity for forgiveness and mercy. Let's take a look at both aspects as they are seen in this story. First of all, God's holiness, which leads to his wrath. What was the message that Jonah gave the people of Nineveh? It's very short, what we have recorded here. In Hebrew, it's just five words. In English, a couple more than that. Here's the message from the account. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Period. That's shorter than most of my sermons. And it's very pointed. And it's very blunt. And we know from the text that God is the one who gave Jonah that message. So it's from God. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. It's a message of judgment. And as an aside, my guess is that Jonah was only too pleased to give it. Because Jonah was waiting for those 40 days to be over and to see God do what it was that he said he would do. That's the message. Doom and gloom. Hellfire and brimstone. Damnation. Boy, that all sounds so old-fashioned, doesn't it? No, we don't want to think about that aspect of God. But the Bible is very clear. God is a holy God who punishes sin with perfect justice. He says very clearly in the New Testament, the wages of sin is death. That's not changed. It's never going to change. Because it stems from who he is as a holy God. A holy God cannot accept unholiness. And so sin gets punished. Which means sinners get punished. And if you doubt that, then ask the people of Noah's day. Ask the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Read the Old Testament prophets. Read Jesus' own words. Ask Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. God is a holy God, and because of that, he punishes sin. The wages of sin is death. And what the message to the Ninevites was, you are unholy people. Forty days from now, you're gone. You're obliterated off the face of the planet forever. Not wanting this to be true doesn't change the fact that it is true. Ignoring it doesn't make it go away. God's holiness will not allow sin and righteousness to go unpunished. I've heard people say, I hate reading the Old Testament because it's all about judgment and all about killing and all about those things. There's a lot of that in there, yes, but it's an aspect of God that we have to understand is, is valid. God will punish sin and sinners. And if we only preach a God of love and mercy, we don't preach the whole gospel. If we don't preach the fact that God punishes sin, that sin needs to be atoned for, that repentance is required, if we don't preach that, then we're not preaching the gospel, we're not preaching good news. Because it's only in the light of that that the gospel is good news. This week I discovered that there are many, many, many sermons on the internet, and especially on YouTube. Do you know what the most downloaded sermon on YouTube is? 
all the sermons that are on there. It's a sermon by Joel Osteen. And it never mentions Jesus once. And it never mentions sin and judgment and condemnation and wrath or repentance once. That's what people want to hear, a message without that. But folks, we can't give in to that because this is the truth of God's word. Sin separates us from God and God will punish sin. That's what he did on the cross. And if you read the Bible, we see at the end, ultimately, sin, evil, death, everything is banished forever. God's not kidding. When he said 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed, he meant it. And it was consistent with who he is, consistent with his character. But let's look at the second side of God here. His love, which results in his mercy. We see near the end of the chapter, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Did God change his mind? No. Was it just an empty threat that he would destroy them? No. Did he simply say, never mind, April Fools? No. What happened here is God's nature of love reached out to the Ninevites and resulted in his mercy given to them. He canceled the intended judgment. And make no mistake, he was ready to do it. But why did he cancel it? He canceled it because of the response of the people. This is the essence of really of what God has always desired. You read the Old Testament. You read all the judgment passages and all the rest. Why are they there? Why did God do that? Why did God say those things through the prophets? It's to get people's attention and say, it doesn't have to be that way. There's a way out. If you will just do what I tell you to do. If you will just live for me. If you will just accept the gift of grace that I offer you through Jesus Christ. This is the essence of what God has always desired for his creation. We read in the New Testament, The Lord is not wishing that any should perish, but that all should receive repentance or reach repentance. We dare not take a look at God executing his justice and have Picturing him kind of clapping away and saying, boy, that was fun. I enjoyed that. The judgment is necessary because of who he is. But his desire is that we would avoid his wrath by coming to him. And the people of Nineveh did that. And because the people in Nineveh did that, God's mercy extended to them and he said, I will not destroy you. God responds to true repentance and does not give us what our sins deserve. I said if we only preach, uh, if we don't preach judgment and wrath, we're not preaching the whole thing. But if we don't preach love and mercy, we're not preaching the whole thing either. I've heard some preachers, I've read some books, And they seem sort of like Jonah, where they really kind of love to be able to tell people, you're going to get it. Because you're evil, because you're wicked, God's going to get you. Our message that we preach is that the love of God is so strong that those of us under a death sentence, as Nineveh was, if we will but repent and come to God through Jesus Christ, we'll be spared and given so much. 
Both aspects of God we see in this story, and both are necessary for each one of us to understand. And we also learn here that the way to revival is to hear God and understand his message. To recognize that God's holy standards have been broken. And because of that, we will incur wrath, individually and as a nation or society. But if we will exercise true repentance, that will bring God's mercy. God said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. That's the path to revival. That's what Nineveh did. And God was true to his word. And as I said, that's true of individuals and true for entire societies as well. I close with this. There's a wonderful verse in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2. You may actually want to make a note of this somewhere so that you can refer to it later because you'll probably forget. Habakkuk 3, 2. Let me read it to you. In the context of what we've been looking at this morning, Habakkuk writes, Lord... I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Wow. We could take a little while and just pounce on that verse. I know that many of us pray for revival in our nation. This is the prayer. Habakkuk is saying, says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. In other words, I know what you've done in the past. For us, I see what you've done in Nineveh. I stand in awe of your deeds. And we always stand in awe of what God does. He says, Lord, repeat them in our day. What's he saying? Now. We need it now. What you did in the past, we need it now. Do it in our day. In our time, make them known. Listen to the last phrase. In wrath, remember mercy. You see both sides there? In wrath, remember mercy. What would happen if the people of our time were to pray that prayer Consistently, persistently, sincerely. What might God do? What might God do? And what would that look like? And what would that experience be? I can think of no better prayer to utter as we look around at our world today. Are we any better than Nineveh? Really? Are we any less deserving of God's wrath than they? Billy Graham's wife, Ruth, famously said once, if God doesn't punish America, he'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Think about it. I look at Jonah chapter 3. And I look at what happened in Nineveh, and I find hope. I find hope for our world. Because if he can do it in Nineveh, he can do it again. I just titled this message, Do It Again. Do it again. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Lord, repeat them in our day. Make them known. In our time, in wrath, remember mercy. Will you join me in that prayer? Let's go to him now.
Father, I can find no better words than those uttered by Habakkuk as we consider what you have done in the past, as we consider the current state of our world, our nation, of our neighbors, of ourselves. Lord, we echo the words of Habakkuk. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so, Lord, we say, do it again. Do it again. This we ask in Jesus' name.